Thank you very much all for attending. Um, my name is Christoph Pettis. I'm the CEO of PostgreSQL Experts. We're a Postgres consultancy out in California. Um, the, this is the URL of my, the, the domain name of my personal blog. That's where the slides will be, so if you want to check them out, here's our company website, hire us for something. Uh, there's my Twitter handle and there's my email address. So um, what we're going to be talking about here is PCI compliance kind of as a jumping off point about to talk about general database security. So what is PCI? It's the Payment Card Industry Security Standards Council. Um, so, so it sets the security standard for any system that processes payment cards. Um, so what we're really going to be talking about is the, a document that this, this organization produces, which is PCI DSS, the Data Security Standard. Um, how many people run a website where people type in their credit card numbers right now? Okay, good. This will be relevant, directly relevant to you, um, because I guarantee you, you are almost probably you are probably doing this wrong, unless you're Square or somebody like that. Because I did it wrong for a long time. Fortunately, I was never busted. I fixed it first. Um, the most recent version of the the standard is 3.1, which was issued in April 2015, and that's what we're going to be talking about. So, why do you care about this? Well, you know, it is kind of nice to be paid for um, so and the way people pay for stuff online is with a credit card. And anything that touches a, pay, a payment card information needs to comply with PCI. Um, all of it, no exceptions. If somebody types a credit card number into your site, presses submit, and that credit card number goes over to you, you must comply with PCI. Or you're going to be in a heap of trouble if you ever got caught. Um, you know, you and everyone has their exceptions. It's like the bargaining stage of grief you know, uh, of loss. Everyone thinks, oh no, I, it, PCI doesn't apply to me because I encrypt it in the JavaScript before I send it over or something like that. You are wrong. It applies to you. So what does it mean to comply? And you know, that's actually a really good question because there's no single thing that says you are compliant with PCS, PCI if you do the following things and, it, and if you've checked all the boxes, you're compliant. Really what that means is you pass an audit either an external audit or an internal um, self-evaluation to say, yes, we're compliant. Um, below a certain volume of transactions, you can self-audit. You don't have to hire a company to come in and audit you. You can just check the list. But, and this is where a lot of smaller sites fall down, even if you self-audit, you still have to comply with every single point of PCI. All of it. Um, so who does? So what, what makes you subject to PCI is, it, is if you um, process what's called the primary account number, which is just a fancy way of saying your credit card number, you know, the number at the beginning that begins with a four or a five or a three seven, or a two plus a two and a bunch of other digits. MasterCard is just about to start issuing cards that begin with the digit two. So all those places in your code where you say card paren, card, card, um, card array subscript zero equals equals five, and uh, to check for a, a, a MasterCard, you're gonna have to add two to that. Um, so it's the number on your front of your credit card. That's a primary account number. It's really easy. Um, even if you don't store that number in the database, you still have to comply with PCI. Hopefully this is not a news to everybody, but it's true. So if you're, you say, okay, but I comply. The auditor handed me this document that said you've, you've complied with uh, PCI DSS 3.1 and now you're safe. No. Because safe and compliant are not the same thing. Just passing the audit means you get to play. You get to, you get to process credit cards. It doesn't mean that you get to win in the sense that you will never have a breach. If you do have a breach, the fact that you pass the audit provides you no protection whatsoever. Um, sometime if you want to have a blood curdling experience, read your agreement with your credit card processor because you are liable for every single penny of loss that is ever suffered by a customer or a bank for having processed credit cards. So, having scared you all, let's talk about getting a, what, what it takes to get a Postgres database PCI compliant. Um, there's a lot more involved in getting fully PCI compliant on the whole stack, and that's kind of outside the scope of this talk. But it's also, and I think this is why it's, this topic is the most interesting, because even for people who don't touch credit card numbers, it's a, good way, it's a good thing to think about all the various steps that are necessary to get a database secure. So, first of all, if you are if you do process primary account numbers, get and read a copy of, of this to see what it requires of you. Um, you. We won't be able to go through every single point, um, and it's mostly we're going to focus on that. We're almost exclusively going to focus on the technical stuff, 
but there's also policies and procedures that are required of you, and those are equally important. So pick up a copy and read it. It's not that long. Um, this is, and also this is the absolute minimum you need to do. Um, by itself, just following these slides will not guarantee that you'll pass an audit or anything like that. Um, you know, so think this is a journey of security, and this is your start, not your end. Um, so the PC, PCI is, uh, DSS is divided into six sections with 12 requirements each. Um, each one of these means, gives you something you have to do to your Postgres system. Uh, so let's go through them all. It'll be fun, really. It'll be great. You'll love it. So the first requirement is firewalls. Um, the top, the top level requirement is you have to have a firewall. Um, the implicate, what it really is talking about is not so much that you just have to buy a firewall and slam it into your rack and call it good, but that your database ser that, that any server that's in this chain has to offer the minimum services necessary to be operational. Uh, so don't run your IRC server on your Postgres box. You laugh. This is a real life example. Um, they, they also ran their mail server on the box that had primary account holder information, and it was send mail. And it was an unpatched old version of send mail. That was kind of an easy win from a security point of view. Um, so your Postgres server should just be running Postgres in terms of services, obviously. If it's running NT NTP, that's fine. But um, in terms of generally publicly available services that aren't necessary for system operation, the only port that anyone should be connecting to is 5432 or whatever you run Postgres on. Um, plus any ports that are mandatory for management, like obviously you need to connect to the box, so at some point you need to run SSH from somewhere, but you don't, but don't run any, um, any, ser any other services. Don't run a web server on it, even if it's only used for management. Um, also, you need to lock down 5432, so only the application servers that, can, that need to talk to the database can get, get to it by IP address. So don't rely on just, the, just being inside the VPN, for example, to lock it down, because it's, at that point, if someone breaches any host in the VPN, they can get at your database. So use pghba.conf to nail down the, the to just authorized um, IPs with mandatory SSL connections. If you're running in a cloud provider, you're pretty much running on the public internet. If you're on, if you're running, for example, if you're on AWS, a v, um, v, internal VPC traffic is not encrypted automatically. Somebody else could potentially sniff it. They might have to work at it, but just run SSL everywhere, you know, it's the right thing to do now. Um, and at the host level, nail down everything additionally using IP tables. Don't rely on just PG, PGHB at a, a conf as your only line of protection. Don't let, the, don't let outside, um, outsiders, people outside your, your own infrastructure, log into the database server directly. Have a secure bastion host and make that the only place people, people have to SSH to that first and then hop to your database. Um, and ideally, restrict access to the, to the Bastion host by VPN. Don't just have port 22 dangling out there available for anybody to try. Make them connect to a VPN and then connect to the, um, uh, to the Bastion host. And you know, I'm amazed that people think, oh, well, it's secure because we're running it on 2222. Come on, everybody knows that now. Okay, requirement number two is security policies. So don't use vendor disp um, supplied defaults for passwords and other parameters. Okay, you know, dull. Nobody does that, right? Sure we do. That's the default Postgres installation with trust mode, with, uh, with, lo with, local, uh, with local peer or trust mode. That's a vendor supplied default. So, don't, so change that. Don't let people do, what, do this. Um, so first of all, in your pgh.conf, there is no such thing as trust authentication. Forget that ever existed. That is, it, so that is completely, that should you be banished from your memory that Postgres has trust mode authentication. Always require specific um, users, even super users. Don't, um, don't use the, the, the Unix or um, Postgres super, um, default accounts. Require specific users. There should be, if, you, if I'm administering your database and I'm allowed super user access, it should be CPEDIS, not Postgres. So you can use, LDAP can be your friend here as much as LDAP is anyone's friend, um, so that you can manage, manage these, so you're not always um, creating and deleting role, role after role after role. 
if you're using, for system administration, use specific users in sudo. Never ever allow root logins. I hope everyone knows this is a general rule, but it's required by PCI, so just do it. Use some kind of password manager. Always, always, always. Don't make people memorize these giant, horrible passwords. Ideally, you should be using keys. Um, for critical passwords, for things that you don't have to use very often, like, um, like a, sometimes you, uh, like a general purpose pseudo password, have split, um, have dual custody so that one person can't do this on their own initiation. Um, as of now, uh, well, as of next month, yes, June, um, to, um, versions of TLS 1.2 don't exist as far as PCI is concerned. Your, your server, the only thing people can use to connect to your servers is TLS 1.2. 1.0 and 1.1 are no longer allowed for, um, for PCI compliant systems. This includes your public facing website. So figure out how to do that on Apache or Nginx. So you have till next month. I believe it's the end of the month, but it might be June 1st. So um, always subscribe to the, um, to the PG Announce list. This is actually the, that you subscribe to a, a reliable form of system updates is required by PCI. So you need to do this. And always up, immediately apply any security related updates. I was kind of horrified when I logged into a system um, that in fact stored primary account information and it was running Postgres 930. Setting aside the fact there are horrible replication bugs in 9.3.0, it's not exactly up to patch. Um, and also make sure you read the security, you know, don't, don't, wait, you know, don't wait to get an announcement on Twitter of like, oh, my, oh wow, there's this horrible SSH um, compromise out there. You know, make sure, you want to be the, one of the, the first person on your block to notice this. Because I assure you, as soon as it hits any list anywhere, every single person has a, um, um, has a script that exploits it. And so keep up to date with patches on your primary servers also. You should be doing this. So, and you know, especially at small companies, this can fall through the cracks, but make it someone's job. Somebody is going to get evaluated on how well they executed this and make sure they actually do it. Um, and just never ever, if there's a critical security patch on any platform, let, um, let it go unheeded. Go in and do it, ever, ever, ever. This is really important. And unfortunately, most companies don't do this, even very large ones. Okay, requirement number three is protect stored cardholder data. At last, we figured it's like this is what it's all about, is how to, how to secure the actual cardholder data. So this is a paraphrase of exactly, they say, well, we're, it's no problem because we got Lux, the you know, encrypted volume manager for Linux, and, we layered, that, uh, and we, we layered that on top of LVM, and it's on top of EBS, and yeah, okay, it runs at about you know, 83 kilobytes a second, but we're all set. No. This is not compliant. Full disk encryption is useless. Let me say that again. Full disk encryption is useless. It does not if it is okay for a laptop, but for a server, it is useless. Because it protects you against exactly one problem, which is theft of the media. If people are routinely going in and breaking into US East 1 and ripping off the hard disks, we have other problems. That's it. This is the, that is the only problem full disk encryption protects you against, which is a, a vanishingly small percentage of the, uh, of the intrusions that you have to worry about. So the, the rule is if you can log in with PSQL and read the cardholder information in clear text, which you can if you're using full disk encryption, then, the, the, then it's not secure. Always do per column encryption. Always encry uh, in, encrypt specific um, columns not the entire database or disk. First of all, it gives you better performance, and second of all, it gives you higher security. Store encrypted data in the database rather than just layering encryption on top of the database. Um, the problem with this is key management is a pain because the application does need to have the keys necessary to decrypt this stuff, which means that in a high security environment, automatic restart is basically impossible because someone somewhere has to, turn, turn this, um, has to flip the switch to turn this on. So you kind of just have to suck this up. Just assume that in case of a reboot, a human will be in the loop. Somebody gets to carry a pager. So you have to encrypt the primary account number, given. The algorithm has to be a well-known secure one. Um, whether or not you like AES or not is, you know, I've, I've heard crypto, I, I am not qualified to judge. Crypto people argue about AES. However, it is considered good enough by PCI. 
never roll your own crypto. I hope everyone knows this, but if you, um, if you have not made a career of being a mathematician who understands cryptography, you are rolling your own crypto means you are just creating a, a, an easily reversible hash algorithm. Don't do it. And the keys can't be baked into the code or stored in repositories. It's really embarrassing when one of your, public, when one of your um, private encryption keys shows up in a public GitHub repo. And if a, a small, a small go, uh, Google search will reveal this happens a lot. Um, now, one thing you can store is the max number. Actually, PCI lets you display the first six and the last four, which is 10 digits out of a 16-digit number, which seems a pretty generous to me. I would only do the last four. But you can, store, you can keep that much unencrypted for display purposes. So everybody's seen this on websites. You know, you paid with Visa number 1387. Um, you know, but really just keep the last four in the card type. You can also store a hash of the card number for indexing purposes. For example, if you have a CSR who needs to look up something by, um, like you get a chargeback and you need to look it up by credit card number, you can have an interface that you type in the number, it gets hashed, and then does the query, an index query. So it doesn't have to search, do a, a sequential search across the entire database. But be careful with your hashing algorithm. Don't do MD5. Because if you have the mass number, it can be really easy to reverse the hash if it's a weak hash. Use something like SSH, uh, SHA 512 or something like that. So at this point, people are thinking, I know, PG Crypto. Perfect, I win. Finally, the PG Crypto is the most useful module I've never actually used. Um, it's a contrib module, it contains all sorts of cryptographic functions. It links with OpenSSL, so it's as good as OpenSSL. You know, take that for what. Um, so why not you just use it to encrypt the pan? I mean, you know, it's just sitting there. It's great. Okay, problem solved. We do something like this. You know, we have my super, I have a super secret table, and we in, with a card number, and we call encrypt and then super secret password, and that's great. And then we're doing a load test on the um, on the server, and there it is in the logs. So we've just revealed the plain, the the primary account number in plain text in a log, which is needless to say, a along with the encryption password, for ex for good measure. So, yeah, that wasn't so great. Um, the problem is that the text logs can expose the pan because it's, it's logging traffic. And it's another hop that the data has to take in clear text form from your application server to the database server. So always do the encryption in the application, not in the database. That's the, that's, that's the ultimate advice. Okay, so we say, all right, all right, Krasov. I've, we, we got it. So we're gonna build this thing. It's gonna have an, an ID, which is a UUID, because I like using UUIDs for my primary keys. And we have a card type, and I'm using a fancy enum, Postgres enum, and the mass card, which is the last four digits. Um, I'm using care instead of vercare, so I don't have to pay the, pay the extra four bytes of length count for something that's always going to be four characters. Um, and I have a card hash for searching, and the encrypted primary account number, and the encrypting CVV, uh, which, you know, the, the, the one where it says the three digits on the back of your card that they always tell you about, or the four digits on the front of American Express, because Amex has to be different. Um, and expiration date. Okay, perfectly reasonable schema, right? So what's wrong with this schema? It's almost okay, but that CVV. You can't store the CVV. This comes as a really big surprise. You can't even write it down on a phone transaction. So all those people who are saying, now can I get the three numbers? They are breaking their merchant services agreement when they say this. Needless to say, this is not widely enforced, but if you ever have an intrusion and people are auditing you, they're gonna look for this. You can't store it at all, not even encrypted. So, well, you can, well, all right, almost. You can store it, but for only for as long as the authorization takes. If you do an immediate authorization, you could store it somewhere and then throw it away. So we just store it and process the authorization and clear it out, okay? Let's you know set the, make it a nullable field and we record it and then the background job that does the processing picks it up and okay that all sounds reasonable. So about that PostgreSQL secondary you have, with all those wall logs and all the wall archiving that you're doing for des disaster recovery that now all have the CVV recorded in them. That's those aren't allowed either. No storage means no storage. You can't store them in wall segments. You can't store them in backups. You can't store them in text logs, even in encrypted form. This is my favorite thing. This is always the first thing I look for when I'm doing a PCI audit because everyone gets busted on this, ever. That's the rule. Um, 
of course, now, if you go and like buy credit card numbers on the internet, they're about a buck 20 now, on, you know, from, from a black hat. Um, the CVV always comes along with them because everyone does this. And, you know, you can go for the rest of your life and not care about this as long as you never get audited. So, you know, you can decide what you want to do there. So just don't ever write it to the database. Just don't. So requirement number four is encrypt data in flight. Um, so encrypt the transmission of cardholder data across open public networks. Um, you know, I kind of hope you're doing this. <laughs> this is like the, the, the first thing everyone learns is make sure you're using SSL on your website. Um, so really at this point, just go TLS everywhere. Um, use H, um, HSTS. Um, strict transport security um, and enforce and make sure your whole website is it. You, that way, you know, when you run a test on SSL labs, you get an A plus and it looks really good. It, it, you know, use it for marketing material. So just, so, you know, just do that. And remember, as of June, you can't use TLS 1.0 or 1.1 to connect to the website if it, if it, if it contains cardholder data, which means some old, old, old browsers will break. Take it up with PCI. That's the rule. Also, this means for Postgres, you want to turn on SSL. So require all of your connections to Postgres to use SSL. Um, if you're using PG Bouncer, which lots and lots of people are, I love it, you're, this means you're gonna to want to stick Stunnel before, before it and after it, because by itself, PG Bouncer doesn't do SSL connections. PG Pool does, but PG Bouncer does not. Ideally, you want to use proper certificate management, like create your own certificate authority and distribute the certificates and do all the right stuff for this, assuming you don't want to pay someone to like, be a certificate authority for you. Um, but at the minimum, you want, you, you want to make sure all your internal infrastructure is passing around SSL. Uh, requirement five is protection against malware. I'm, I'm not going to go over this because this is a fairly deep topic and you know security people can go on are much smarter than this. It also requires a fair amount of Windows expertise and Windows is something that happens to other people as far as my career goes. But the requirement is you have to have malware protection um, with regularly updated antivirus as things. Um, specifically, anything that accesses the database needs to have this. And the reason is this is how large scale data breaches happen. For all of the, the concerns that PCI dumps on you, really, the way data breaches tend to happen is someone gets a virus into a window-based till, you know, window-based uh, point of sale system. That's usually how these, like, that's how the target breach happened. Um, these things where you read about, you know, 23 million credit card numbers exposed, it's usually, that's usually because some malware managed to work its way into a point of sale system at a big retailer. So, um, why, you know, so why they have, you know, Windows NT based POS systems at this point is another matter, is a question beyond the scope of this talk. So requirement six, I, I sort of paraphrase this as be a grown up, um, which is you ha develop and maintain secure systems and applications. You can imagine what, how much fun it is to like check off like, yes, I think this customer developed and maintained secure systems and applications. What does that even mean? But what it means at a minimum is document all your system administration procedures. Don't have oh, God, he's on vacation and we don't remember how to do this. Or she left, but she was the only one who knew how to do X. There should be institutional knowledge there. Do security code reviews and audits, especially on um, transactional systems that touch cardholder or other sensitive information. And make sure that your deployment procedures are solid. Because very frequently a deployment procedure can expose things if a bug, um, either through a bug or because there's a crashing error it's very embarrassing that when you start getting crashing errors and you start seeing cardholder information in the stack trace. Um, a specific requirement of the, a sub-requirement here is, 651 is, no, is guard against SQL injection attacks. If whatever library you're using, make sure you're doing proper parameter substitution. It really pains me when I see someone using a really nice library like, like PsychoPG, and they're just building strings. With, to build the where clause. You don't have to do that. There's a very nice parameter substitution feature built into, built into the API, into, into the libpq protocol. Use that. So never build SQL by text substitution unless you, it's absolutely necessary. There are some things that you can only do by text substitution, like if you're writing a script that um, has a variable uh, table name in it, that can't be parameterized. That's not a very common case, though. 
So, and hopefully you're not building a table name based on something a user typed in unmodified from a website. If not, go fix that, please. Um, just remember, anything a user types anywhere in the system is hostile and wants to kill you. Whatever the, every single bit of user input will be crafted to be maximally damaging to your system. It will be too large, it will use unusual Unicode characters, it will be something horrible. Um, so just make sure, make sure that you treat, it, you, you treat it as you know, hazardous waste and deal with it appropriately. This is also, unfortunately, fairly frequently uh, broken, which is that you have to restrict the data by need to know. Um, so be, people who do not need to have access to, customer, to primary account information aren't allowed to see it. This includes don't give every developer access to the production system. Because, the, because unless you can argue every single developer in your system has a reason they need to be able to look up customers by credit card number. So you need to identify specific system administrators who need global system access and make sure that they're qualified to handle that. And so, um, if, if you do something I recommend, actually, which is you prime developer machines from backups of the production system, make sure you have a way of scrubbing that data and replacing the encrypted uh, cardholder information with something unencrypted or, or something, you know, four, four plus 15 ones or something okay, like that. Um, whatever you're doing about passwords, you're probably doing wrong for PCI, unfortunately. Um, you need to, uh, the, the basic requirement is identify and authenticate access to system components. However, this ha there are lots of implications the way this is written in the spec, which is user accounts have to be associated with a particular human being, not a role. People are, should not be logging in as Ubuntu. They shouldn't be logging in as Postgres. They should be logging in as them, the, as a particular username that's only associated, that they are the only um, human being allowed to access. Um, PCI specifically requires that after six uh, attempts, you need to lock them out, bad attempts to log in. Um, and it needs to be re immediately revoked for terminated users. Like while they're in HR getting their, their term documents, that account is gone. It's probably a good idea anyway, if, especially if you're doing a layoff. So it, um, PCI requires complex passwords, which are a good idea. Specifically, though, these, these, these complexities have to be enforced. You can't just tell people, make sure your passwords are good. You have to enforce good passwords. It doesn't actually go into what a good password is. We all have different ideas, but, you know, that's, but it, it needs to be long and messy. You know. um, they have to be rotated every 90 days, and they have to be encrypted in transmission. That last one, I hope, is non-controversial. Um, and PCI specifically requires that, when it, that uh, as part of the rotation, you can't use the, um, that you have to keep track of the last four, um, the last four and reject it to attempt to reuse it. Who does this? No. <laughs> Fortunately, I don't touch primary cold information on any of the sites I administer. But yeah, but, but PCI does require this. And notice, even if you're a tiny company that self audits, you're still required to do this, even if no one's coming and busted you for it. And now, as of 3.1, you have to do two factor authentication. Welcome to hell for system administration. Um, and you have to have at least two of these a password or passphrase. A phys um, password or passphrase, as written, inter includes a public key. So that's something. Um, a physical device or a smartphone app, so a fob or something like that, or a biometric device. So this probably means you get to go out and use Duo or something, Duo Mobile or something. Um, and this is now required by PCI. Whee. So when you've connected, sessions have to be logged, including all the activity during that session. So if it's a, it's a machine that contains prim, primary cold information, you have to have a record of everything people do on that machine and associated with a particular user. And they have to be terminated by, after, uh, after being idle for 15 minutes or more. Who does that? Yeah. Um, for Postgres, this means you have to make sure every user has their own unique account. No logging in as Postgres, no logging in as RDS admin, you know, <laughs> no logging in as those guys. Um, you have to log all connections to disconnections. Fortunately, Postgres has that functionality. Um, you have to log all the activity by directly connecting users. It doesn't require that all application um, 
operations be logged, but it does require that, that anything with PSQL be logged. You can do this by, the, by having the users that, the usernames that are associated with particular human beings set um, log, log min statement duration to zero and set um, so that you can, you can capture all their activity. And don't permit logins as the Postgres super user because that's not traceable to a particular human being. So where your server actually lives has to have requirements. You have to have, have physical access restricted. Generally, this means they don't go into detail about what this means, but this means really real security, like access control video, man traps, biometrics. Generally, it means you have to stick this thing in a real in a, in a data center that can handle this stuff, um, like one that handles banks. Um, so if you're just signing up with a regular uh, normal cloud provider, make sure the cloud provider does this stuff because if if an audit comes in it's not the cloud provider who's going to be in trouble. It's going to be you for picking one that doesn't comply. And you have to log everything. You're going to have lots of logs. You have to, um, all accesses to network and, um, resources and cardholder data, um, which means everything is logged and you need to make sure these logs are secure and not able to be tampered with, at least without you knowing someone was tampering with them. So this means you're using our syslog or something like that to ship the data someplace um, to a different machine. The, the basic requirement, and this is devilishly hard to do completely, is that each log, that each entry has to be traceable back to a particular person. It's important to know this happened, but you also want to know who did it or whose compromised account did it. But just remember, you can't log PANs and CVVs in clear text, um, which is another good reason to encrypt in the application, not in the database. So you have to test all this stuff. And, and also keep a written record that you did. So you, um, I, if you touch primary card information, I strongly suggest you hire an external penetration testing firm um, and encur encourage developers to be nasty about it um, and, and poke at you, uh, you know, not harm normal operations. Um, also, if you're going to hire a PCI audit company, uh, um, hire one whose job, it, and these will be a little more expensive, but one who's, who doesn't just fire up a bunch of Perl scripts and, ho and, and email you the results. Because this, I had this conversation, is that they say, um, I sign up for a pen test firm and they come back about a day later and say, well, we, we need you to turn off your firewall. Blink, blink, uh, why? Well, our pair, we can't get through the firewall so it, the, the penetration test script is failing. You know, that sound, kind of, to me that kind of sounded like what a firewall is supposed to do. You know, this is like failing somebody because they say, well, we couldn't, you know, um, writing up a report that says the, the, gate, the gate to the house, the gate to the yard was locked, so we couldn't tell if the door was unlocked or not. You know, so I understand what they're, I, you know, to be fair to them, I understand what they're trying to do. Their job was to check off these scripts, th these, ho these hosts don't have any excess ports running, but since the firewall was blocking that, they couldn't. So what I wanted was somebody who said, okay, here's what we're going to, we're going to give you a list of IPs and a time window and that sort of thing, and we need you to do that. Unfortunately, they weren't technologically sophisticated enough to do that. All they knew how to do was push the button and get an email report. Okay, and requirement 12 is document everything. You know, maintain all these things in, in written policies. Um, ideally, this is something that somebody should actually get to have to sign and say, yes, I agree, I will do this stuff. Um, you know, so just make sure you have the big book of the big book of security policies, um, and really, real life production systems that handle any human being's data. You should be doing this stuff anyway. So the problem is, you get all through this, and you say, "I'm a like a three person company that sells pottery, and you've just like completely destroyed my life by telling me all this stuff." So there is there are two ways out. And the first first there's the hard way, and there's the there, the first way is there's Appendix B, which says, you know, what if you just can't do this stuff for for whatever reason? Appendix B lets you write up what's called. So after going through all this, it lets you write up a stuff that says, well, you can write up what's called a compensating control, which basically says, well, we can't do that, but we can do this, and we argue this is just as good as the thing we're not doing. Um, for example, Oracle Total Disk Encryption has a, um, will, will Oracle will be happy to email you an Appendix B compensating control explaining why their total disk encryption is just as good as anything else. Because at least one very large credit card company uses total disk encryption even though technically it's not PCI compliant. Um, you know, for example, 
it might not be practical to set up your root login with LDAP for whatever reason. Um, so what you can do is say, okay, we're just not going to allow root login at all, and we're going to and just make people use sudo. And actually, it gives this as an example of a compensating control in the spec, so I assume they mean this is okay. Um, just remember, it's not a complete get out, get out of free jail card. If you don't need an external auditor, it's just between you and your conscience, what you put in, a, in as a compensating control. If you do hire an external auditor, they have to sign off on the compensating control. And they have to be just as good as, or at least have a plausible argument that they're just as good as, whatever you're not doing. So you can't just say, well, so um, we are a small company, it would be too expensive to comply is not a valid compensating control. So, you know, you've, you've been listening to me rant at you about all this stuff, and you're probably thinking, like, oh, my God, this is awful. Um, you know, we're doomed here. You know, because full and correct PCI compliance is a lot of work. Just talk to anybody who works at Square in their security department. Um, and there's a huge downside risk. Um, because if you get hacked and the credit cards are stolen and used, every single penny of loss because what will happen is, it'll appear, this will appear on, on the customer statement on a, as a credit card charge. They're going to call the credit card company and say, not mine. Credit card company is going to um, charge it back. And then the, the answer is, well, the bank will accept the risk because they make all this money on credit cards. Ha. Huh. No, it'll go straight back to you. And banks are really good at figuring out where a breach came from by patterns of chargebacks. So every single penny will ultimately be charged to you, plus damages. And when you signed up for credit card processing, you signed up for that as well. And oh, by the way, they can just take that money from you without any legal process. This is, you know, read the credit card state, credit card merchant account agreements are like the worst contract you will ever sign in your entire life. So you know, banks don't take risk. Merchants take risk in the credit card world. But there is, so what I'm going to encourage you to do is do something that means you can ignore this entire talk. Well, I don't want you to ignore this entire talk because I do want you to internalize the security aspects of it, but in terms of specifically credit card processing, what I encourage you to do is do this, which is if you don't touch primary account numbers, you can avoid most of PCI. Um, you know, the, the first steps along those lines were things like PayPal, but they're not suitable for many environments, and you know, if you've ever dealt with PayPal as a merchant, you may have reason, your own reasons for not wanting to deal with PayPal. Um, so we're finally getting a better solution, and it only took like 20 years which is tokenization. Um, tokenization replaces the PAN with a token. The, the system runs a service where you hand it the PAN and it hands you back a, t a token, um, which is not the primary account number, and it's locked to your merchant account. So the, the token isn't considered a PAN, so most of PCI doesn't apply, um, as long as you never store the PAN, even temporarily. As long as you never, ever touch that primary account number, like in your website, you like in the front in the, in the JavaScript, you hand hand it the pan and get back a token, you're fine. Um, the nice part about this is the whole PCI headache gets transferred to the tokenization API vendor, so you don't have to deal with it, which is exactly what you want. There's a big gotcha here, though, which is like a lot of um, you know you when you when you rent, um, hop into a hotel, you they they swipe or now chip your card, and they get an authorization. And later, they close that. They close it. So the problem is a lot of these interfaces won't let you um, won't, um, won't let you process this until you actually do a sale, which means these um, services like that can't use it. Which means you because the only thing you can do is store the authors um, store the authorization because if you don't, you have to store the pan into the database. And even if you store it for a short while, then you're back to PCI compliance land. So you have to do the sale immediately. If you're, this is not universally true, but some of the APIs do require this, which is a shame. Um, Braintree, who, who's a big Postgres supporter, so go Braintree. Um, Stripe, CyberSource, MasterCard. The, uh, MasterCard runs their own gateway now, um, tokenization API now. Um, so if you can integrate this into your system, it's much better than having to deal with PCI. Much, much, much better. So then you can move on to worrying about HIPAA. But that's for a different talk. Okay, questions? Do you have to disable swap? No. That's a, and, and thank you for asking. You do not um, swap. Um, there's, I forget the exact wording of it, but it actually, there's this kind of mumbo jumbo y frame where, where what they're really saying is no, you don't have to disable swap. Um, 
it's like, you know, as required by the operating system for normal system operations or something like that, um, which is actually kind of a big hole, you know, arguably in PCI. Um, but, you know, if it's, um, I think their idea is that your, your exposure, unless, unless you're actually a credit card processing gateway or something that's going to have, have a very high density of account numbers, the, the actual risk is probably pretty small. Yes, um, in back and then. Mm -hmm. Does it, um, as of which version? Oh, I stand corrected. Yay. That, that, uh, which is great because that eliminates one of the big, because that, that whole stunnel, you know, that whole, that whole two levels of stunnel plus PG bouncer thing was not exactly my favorite thing to set up, so. Yes, sir. You know, like I said, PG, PG Crypto is the best module I've never used. I, I always want to use it, and I've never actually come up with an application that uses it. I never say never, um, but I, I just haven't found, a, I haven't found a use for it. I always end up having to do the encryption in the application, um, which it, it's disappointing because it seems so promising, you know, but there it is. You know, I, I, I never, I never thought, I, you know, uh, I never thought it didn't, you know, I guess so, <laughs> but, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, in general, I, t I tell people, always connect to Postgres using, uh, you require SSL, you know. It's like, it's one of those things that maybe that'll be your performance bottleneck, but prove it, to, prove it first, you know, rather than, um, it, it, the, it can be a problem in the case of, Stacks that are that have very high connect disconnect rates because the SSL negotiation time is a little higher, but that in reality that has not been an issue for me. So I would say always use you know you just you know unless there's a compelling reason, just always have SS you know TLS between everything in your stack. Mm-hmm. Don't, you know, the the again, t, um, those all those all those technologies provide our provide protection against theft of the media, which in the case of this is very high. In the case of a server that's locked up inside someone's data center, is very low, and that's not how people get these numbers. These the you know they don't they people are not getting these you know five million pan thefts by walking into a data center and ripping out a disk. You know, they're, what they're doing is they're hacking the application and coming in that way and dumping the data that way. So the important thing is that you want to make, have the, um, the surface of exposure of the unencrypted account number be as small as possible. Because the problem is you have, you know, TDE or Elux or any of these guys. You log in, type PSQL, there's your data. And that's how they're going to get these numbers. So. Um, so I say don't, you know, and <laughs> at least in the case of Lux, wow, is that a performance hit. That being said, some uh, there are you know sometimes you'll have a contractual requirement that have you to have complete disk encryption or something like that, and then you just have to do it, you know, or you know you've you, um, and it, it's not going to it's not going to make it, turning it on doesn't make it less secure, but it um, but it doesn't it it, uh, it doesn't help you against the primary attack vendor which is down the application stack. So why pay for the why pay the performance hit is my feeling as long as the number the data itself is. That being said, if you're in the HIPAA world, you're probably going to have to do total disk encryption because generally that's considered required in HIPAA world. Why? Because somebody who is not super technical wrote the requirements. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, that's us. And thank you very much.